So you started out as a kid actor in Hollywood, uh, Different Strokes, Webster, um, Facts of Life. Uh, did you want to, when did you realize you wanted to be an, an actor as a kid? You know, I fell into it as a kid um, because of my love of superheroes. I used to dress up almost exclusively as Superman, Batman, you know, uh, Spider-Man. I was going to say you were saying the wrong universe. Go on. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, you know, agnostic. I love them both, just like James Gunn. Um, and, you know, I, uh, I, was, I was told that I could not dress up anymore as a superhero when I was a kid. I had to come dressed as a normal kid. Um, and uh, so, you know, one day I, I showed up in normal clothes and... Then I raised my hand to go to the bathroom like you do, you know, in preschool and kindergarten. And she took me to the bathroom and I, you know, pulled down my pants and I was wearing swimming trunks. And she said, uh, you know, why are you wearing swimming trunks? And I said, because today I'm Aquaman. So I was, you know, I probably should have said Namor if I wanted to stay within Marvel. But yes, I was Aquaman. And so I've always been, you know, involved in, you know, imagination and dressing up and loving these characters. And I kind of got discovered um, dressed up as a superhero and um, found my way to doing a commercial when I was four years old. And so I just kind of went from one, you know, job to another. It was a lark that became a profession as a kid. And I ended up spending a lot of time on sitcom sets in the 80s, which was incredibly helpful when I did WandaVision because it felt like a trip down memory lane. Um, and also a bit of therapy, too, because I got to kind of, you know, deal with this crazy past of mine. Um, but along the way, I just be, I fell in love with, you know, what was happening behind the camera and the directors and what they were up to. And uh, I just wanted to ask lots and lots of questions. And then by the time I sort of got out of college, I knew that's going to that's what I wanted to do. You did an episode of Night Court as a kid. Um, is it possible that uh, now that Night Court's been renewed for season two, that that kid will make an appearance on Night Court season two as a grown up and you will direct the episode? Oh my gosh, that's a wonderful idea. Tell them I'm available. Yeah, have them give me a call. Right. I think they would they would love it. You know what? I, I'm right. just um so I wasn't going to ask this, but um obviously I have stuff behind me in my interview. You have stuff behind you in your interview. I'm trying to figure out the choices you made of what to put behind you. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Is, so what what's the stuff behind you? It's a mix, you know, it's a mix um, over one shoulder is Game of Thrones, which was um, a show that I absolutely loved working on and was a really big sort of turning point in my life and in the kinds of cinematic large scale things that I um, could do and was being offered as a result of David Benioff and Dan Weiss giving me a shot on that. Um, there's Rob McElhaney as uh, from The Nightman Cometh, an episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, a show that I worked on for most of my, you know, 20s and 30s um, and uh, some stuff from the, the Geffen Playhouse, the theater that I ran for the last six years, um, some WandaVision stuff above my head, including a Stark toaster from episode one of WandaVision, some Sherlock Holmes, um, uh, some drawings of Spider-Man and Wolverine that I that I got when I met a. Uh, uh, an inker from Marvel when I was about six or seven, who was really kind to me, a guy named Bob Wyacek. And I met him on a train and I told him how much I love Spidey and he drew those for me and I've kept them ever since. And they've been in my office ever since. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's funny because all the stuff behind you is stuff basically you worked on. And I'm just like, I'm a fan of these things. You know, it's a yeah. little bit, a little, little bit different. Um, you directed a lot of TV and I'm curious and, and a lot of one episodes where you'd step in, direct an, uh, an episode, and then, you know, you you go away. Which was the, besides Game of Thrones, which obviously is its own challenge, um, which show was the toughest to step in on, you know, for like one episode um, that required the most work and prep to, to really get it? I mean, certainly the first one, you know, taking that jump off that cliff when I worked on this show once and again, uh, Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskovitz, great filmmakers, uh, found me directing plays in a small theater and gave me a chance to shadow on their show and eventually direct on their show. And um, and that was terrifying, you know, to, to kind of do that for the first time, to realize that you have 200 people looking at you and you have to figure out how to get everyone through the day and through the through the episode. That was that was certainly stressful. But, you know, they all are. I have to say, before I begin any job, I'm up late at night wondering if, you know, if I've got everything worked out, how it's going to go. Um, uh, you know, I think the nerves are actually a part of it. You know, I think if I if I lose the nerves, I'm probably uh, becoming a hack. You know, I, I want to stay invested. So each job is is always difficult. Uh, jumping into why I get to talk to you, um, 
you directed the first episode. You're also an executive producer on the series. For people that don't realize, when you're the when you're directing the first episode of a show like this, can you sort of take people through what exactly that means in terms of, uh, you know, how are you working with Tony in in terms of the casting, the aesthetic of the show, um, you know, every aspect of it? Because it's essentially, if I if I understand it right, it's your fingerprints on everything. Yeah, absolutely. So t Tony sent me the script um, uh, after he had adapted from the novel. So he'd already decided that this was a, you know, a, a novel he wanted to adapt and how he wanted to basically approach it. And I loved it. It just kind of leapt off the page to me. I loved the uniqueness of the voice, the tone, the style, and I certainly loved the central character of Patoff. Um, I'm a I'm a, a fan of I'm a fan of thrillers and mysteries, and I and I love comedy. So when you put them together, it's really exciting. Um, so he sent it to me. We, there was no one cast. We hadn't it hadn't been set up anywhere. It was with MGM as a studio. Um, so we um, decided first to try to find our ideal Patoff. We made a list, and at the very 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 top of the list was. Christoph Waltz and the fact that he was willing to meet with us, let alone sign on to it, was just an incredible um, bit of luck. And we're so grateful to be able to to work with him. He's a genius. And so once we had him on board, then we went around and tried to find the ideal partner. And um, and we ended up luckily again with the top of the list for us, Prime Video with Amazon, and they have been wonderful partners. Yeah. Can you sort of talk about? Um, uh... Uh, the aesthetic of the show and how you wanted to to film the first episode because that's the blueprint that everyone else is going to follow. Right. I you know it's rare when you read something and you just you see it in your head. Um, it happens to me every now and then as a director, but a lot of times you you struggle to kind of visualize things and figure out the best way to tell the story. But this just kind of jumped into my head and I felt like I was you know chasing this you know this sort of imaginary idea of the show the entire time um and part of it I think is just Tony's writing is so excellent but the world that he was that he was creating was evocative and, and I felt like I had a sense of what it should look like and so architecture was very important to me like the the sense of clean lines and and you know in some ways it wanted to feel you know a bit German in a sense you know the way that you know Patoff is um mysteriously from everywhere but the way Chris off is from that part of the world um it, and i looked a lot at korean films i, I you know parasite obviously but others it has that same tone that tone that kind of rides the line between comedy and drama and thriller and I, we we're looking at something similar um and i knew that i wanted to have this juxtaposition between this very kind of old world character and this new gen z modern gaming company so and also the, the idea that there's a kind of youngness to that you know the, the games that they play seem very innocent and simple uh, which stands sort of in ironic juxtaposition to all the sort of more complicated adult, you know, gay morality games that are happening in the office as a result of Patoff showing up. So, you know, we had to design the games from the ground up. We knew that they'd be a big lighting aspect. I wanted to just surround the world with giant screens so that, you know, during the day you had that inundation of that kind of poppy, innocent gaming. And then at night it became this kind of lonely, the, you know, the only way the office is lit really is by these giant compware screens. So, you know, that was all, you know, so how we started to build it. Jess Hall, who is a cinematographer I've worked with a bunch, including on WandaVision, was a great partner on it. And just kind of building this kind of modern tech noir was what we were up to. How much of the eight scripts were done before filming began on the first one? I, uh, I'm trying to recall. I think episode two, I read an episode two and three before we rolled cameras on episode one. I'm always curious how much of a show gets to be block shot. You know, um, but I guess because at the office, it's really not uh, a most happens there. So I guess it really doesn't matter because you have your location. Block shooting can be great. It can be a hugely efficient way to approach something. We didn't do that. We actually shot the pilot for this like a pilot. You know, we weren't 100 percent sure we would continue on. So we knew we had to kind of build something that that could be um you know, the, the start of something great that people would be excited to keep going with. So so we made the pilot and then we had to take a break afterwards to make sure that everybody was digging what we were doing. And then they would give us the, the thumbs up to continue on and do the rest of the episodes. Um, and they did block shoot the rest of the episodes. So two and three, four and five, um, sure. which is just a great way to you. It allows you to be more flexible. You can go to really crazy locations because you have more days to kind of fit everything in. How involved were you as an executive producer? How involved were you in the editing room of the episodes two through eight? Or is it sort of just like, you know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, not so much. You know, I looked at the cuts and 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 you have a few conversations along the way. Um, and I talked to, you know, several of the directors as well, you know, just to kind of talk about tone and style and approach. Um, but really my my job was to edit um, the pilot, you know, to work really closely to, to make sure that that pilot felt like a great template to start. And then after that, you know, obviously want the directors and Tony to kind of have their um, freedom and as they move forward. For soon-to-be fans of the series, what do you think they would be surprised to learn about the actual making of the show? Well, it's interesting. You know, we were talking about what the office place is like post-pandemic. It wasn't really in, in meant to be uh, a pandemic-related story, but just by virtue of the timing we were making it, you know, it really has that kind of the tension of re-entry about it. How are we going to be in relationship to each other? And we were filming it during the Omicron uh, outbreak, the pilot, certainly, and so we had to stop. And I think there's, there is, you know, sort of in the shots, at least in the pilot, that that tension of, oh my gosh, you know, this, the, you know, will we be shut down today or not? I mean, I think there are literally shots in the show where, you know, people are wandering around just a little bit suspicious of each other, you know, as we were filming. I think that probably helped create that tension. Um, you know, luckily we're fine and everyone was healthy. Um, but it is, you know, it is a challenge certainly in the, the modern world. I definitely have other things to talk to you about. Um, I was disappointed that you were not going to be able to make Star Trek. Um, I, I had heard through the grapevine that the script was coming together. Uh, and I'm just curious, have you actually said what your movie was going to be about? No, I haven't. You know, and I, I think I'm probably not really allowed to speak too much about it because I think what they're still working on is a, a version of what I had been working on for the time that I was involved. So my thing, I'm a huge Star Trek fan, but I actually, and I want to talk honestly about this. I actually think that making a Star Trek movie for a hundred or $150 million dollars I don't actually know if it's going to work anymore. And I say it because there's a finite, um, like the, the movies don't tend to perform at these huge numbers at the box office. And I'm wondering, it was the movie you were considering without spoilers, was it one of those where it was going to cost like 150, $100 million, like a, a ton of money? It, it, part two of this is because I actually think that the way forward on a Star Trek movie is maybe to make one that's like 30 to 50 million, that's hard sci-fi, aimed right at the fans and if it gets other people great it's an it's an interesting question you know i think um in our day and age now anytime you go to space in a movie it's expensive and when you're flying around in the enterprise even if you're going to land and be in one place for a long time it's still pretty expensive uh, you have a large cast as well many of whom are really you know well known as because they're amazing and um and so just bringing that group together again isn't a cheap you know uh, event. So I think, yes, uh, the movie that I was planning to make was going to be a, a large tentpole film, you know, and I think that one of the things that, that JJ has done so well is that, you know, he'll be the first to admit he wasn't, um, he didn't grow up being a giant Star Trek fan, even though he's a fan now, but he, he was a huge Star Wars fan. And so I think in rebooting it with Chris Pine and Zoe and, and Zach, he, um, brought a little bit of Star Wars to it, which I think helped expand its audience, you know, in terms of um, the scope and the scale of it and the energy of it. And so I think that, you know, that certainly is is the goal is that to find more and more of an audience for Star Trek. But I am like you, a huge fan of that. Um, and it was a real shame that I, yeah, I couldn't make the timing work on it. I am very much looking forward to um, an Apple series called, uh, well, I don't actually know the title, but it's Godzilla. Um, right. So I'm just curious, how many episodes is that series? Um, that is 10 episodes. And how many did you direct? Two of them. So you did the first two? Yep. Um, I am so curious about this, and I know obviously you can only say so much, but for fans, where does it take place on the timeline in relation to the movies? You know, I can't really say because that's part of the joy of it is, is actually... Uh, timeline is a big part of the storytelling. So just want to say that's part of it, but I can't really say more than that. Sure. I'll say this. Um, Godzilla, every time he shows up on screen, is expensive. Um, it, I mean, it is not cheap to put Godzilla or any monster on screen. So I, obviously, Apple spends money on their series. But how much did you sort of have to, like, figure out, you know, how many seconds of Godzilla can we put in per episode? What's the max we can do? You know what I mean? That, that the VFX conversation has to be a huge part of that series. 
It is. It's a part of everything, obviously, no matter what the scale of something. You always run out of money eventually, even if it's Harry Potter or Star Wars, Star Trek, whatever. You run out of money. Godzilla, you run out of money. Um, but it's um, less about counting up shots, although eventually you have to do that, um, and more just about storytelling. You know, How much was Godzilla uh, going to factor into the story? And and he has a very important um role to play and and how he factors into the series is is a big part of it so that was the bigger driver and there and he's not the only titan that you're going to meet along the way so there's yeah there's a vfx conversation uh constantly happening in that they're making another godzilla movie right now how much did you guys sort of talk like are you doing your own thing and then the movies can do their own thing you know, there is some overlap, though we were not heavily involved in talking about it with Adam Wingard or his team. Um, Legendary is the studio for our show as well as for the films. And so they sort of sit at the juncture there between the two and they have a mythology department there, which is wonderful. And so they weigh in on how things might overlap, how, you know, certain creatures need to stay in one side or the other. And, you know, so there is a lot of conversation about it, but in terms of the sort of how closely the narratives overline, uh, overlap, it's not as um, involved to say an MCU kind of Disney plus to film crossover. It's less um, organized than that. You, I believe are directing another Marvel property coming up. I'm sure you're in prep mode right now. Um, What was it? What is it like actually getting the keys to the fantastic four um, and being the person who's going to bring that to screen in the MCU? I have loved these characters since I was a kid. Um, and so it is a huge joy to be able to work with them, spend time with them every day, um, to bring them into the MCU um, is also a huge joy. Um, so it's it's that. It's just the excitement of being the kid who who found them, you know, when I was six, seven, eight, and now being able to work with them on the big screen is it's amazing. Do you think you're going to be? Are you just focused on Fantastic Four this year? Do you think you could be directing something else? I don't think so. You know, I'm, I'm still finishing up the Godzilla project you were mentioning. Um, we're in post on that and, and have a few more months on that. Um, but Fantastic Four is pretty much my life until Valentine's Day of 2025. I mean, it's very tough to have to spend that much time with those characters. Very <laughs> tough. Right. Um, so listen, a lot of people online have been uh, talking about rumors with casting and all this BS. Um, are you casting right now? Or what can you tease people, in fact, of like where you're at in the pre-production of FF? Um, all the casting stuff that you see here is just rumors. We we are, you know, early in our process there. Um, uh, we have uh, nothing to announce right now. And, uh, and certainly when we do, we'll let you know. When do you actually, because you have a release date, um, do you have the, I, like, do you know when you might start filming? Like, have you sort of mapped out the schedule? Yeah, early next year. Yeah, that's when uh, we plan to go. I like how, how the answers are getting shorter as I get into FF mode. <laughs> <laughs> what, well, let me ask you this. What did you learn? Because obviously you had such a successful with WandaVision. It's like, I mean, it's an incredible series. What can you sort of talk about what you learned making WandaVision, working with Marvel that you are now applying to making FF and a, a big feature film? Marvel is a wonderful place to work. I was thrilled to be able to come back and work with them because even though they produce the biggest movies, it's a very small family of people that you're collaborating with. And they're all lovely people um, who are passionate about what they do. And so um, you are working with huge film fans. Everyone is making the same movie. You're all moving in the same direction. And, and that's just a joy. And it's not very often that that happens, especially when you're dealing with something on a really large scale uh, like the FF. Um, it's it's really fun to be back. I, you know, when you join something for the first time, when, like I did on WandaVision, you're just meeting everybody for the first time. Now it's feels like you're you're spending time with your family, um, which is wonderful. And uh, and so it's it's a great it's a great office to show up to every day. I'm out of time, but I'd like to just ask one more thing, if you don't mind. Um, Marvel has all these upcoming projects, and I'm curious if you went, did you say to them, I want FF? Did they say to you, are you interested in any of these upcoming films? Like, how did you land on FF versus, say, an Avengers movie? FF was just the 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 film that made the most sense in the conversation. Um, you know, it's it's the it's the one that I think I um, naturally gravitate towards. Um, you know, there's there's 
the reason I love Star Trek, I'm sure, is a big part of why I love the Fantastic Four. They are they share a great sense of optimism and the idea of looking to the stars and technology can solve everything and coming together as a family, either a real family in the case of FF or the family that you that you find in the case of the Enterprise. And so there are just a lot of uh, a lot of things about the property that appeal to me, and I'm thrilled that I was able to to be the one that that could do it. Listen, man, I couldn't be more excited for you doing the film. Um, and I'm so happy for everything that's been going on in your career. Uh, you know, the Godzilla, everything else, and consultant. Um, I'm just really happy for you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's great to spend time with you today. Thank you. 